Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining me on the uh, SDTS, Sages, NBT, next big thing. I had to ask what NBT meant. I don't know if you guys knew that. <laughs> and the next big thing conference out here in California. Appreciate oh, it. I know. <laughs> you didn't know <laughs> thank either. You. Yeah. So, um, you know, Care Syntax has been, we were chatting before, in 10 years now um, in the marketplace. Uh, probably the original uh, uh, sort of player on this digital slash digital surgery side. So let's, th let's talk about data-driven surgery versus digital surgery. How do you define the differences there? You want to yeah, that's a good way of putting it. The OG of digital You are the OG, uh, I remember surgery. when it started. Being here you in LA, LA right? Early um, one, one morning. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think you've discussed this also with my co-founder and partner. Digital surgery is a term that kind of existed in the OR for a while now, and I think it meant more integration of devices increasingly digital devices uh, to computers so that you can get some information out. So it's really kind of an intraoperative connotation where you know, you're digitizing analog things. And I think data-driven is the next evolution of that where you're not focusing on just making analog digital, you're actually trying to get the full focus on what kind of output you're getting in terms of content and data and how you can you know, build it into data set and process it and use it to create insights that could create a bigger you know, impact to the overall outcome. So it's a kind of an evolutionary definition, obviously related, because you can't get data unless things are digital, but it's the next gen, I would say. So that's kind of how I think about it, I don't know. Yeah, when I think of digital surgery, digital healthcare, you're thinking about technologies. Um, and the data-driven surgery, data-driven healthcare is, is understanding the principles of data science. And it's very opaque right now. Um, other industries have been much farther ahead than healthcare. But understanding how to, me the data science is all about measurement and improvement. And understanding how to measure things and how to use insights generated from analytics, data visualization tools. There's lots of tools out there to gain insights. But it really does require kind of a human computing symbiosis because that frontline clinical team has to learn how to identify what really matters and how to measure outcomes in terms of value and program that data into the computing. All sorts of amazing analytics tools can happen then, but then that same human team has to then interpret the analysis and apply those insights to be able to lower costs and improve outcomes. And that's data-driven surgery as opposed to the digital concept of technology. When, when do we start measuring data? So this has been really interesting. You know, if you think about the changing centers of care, which continues to be a, a very pertinent conversation as things start to move out of hospitals per se, for the most part, um, when do you start measuring data on that quote unquote patient? Is it, and, and then stratify risk, and then go into the surgery and then post event? Mm -hmm. And when do you stop gathering data? That's the curious question for me, yeah. and you're the data scientist. So that, that requires context, right? So it's different for different contexts. One of the problems in healthcare today is aggregation of data uh, takes many different types of contexts and tries to put it together and then analyze all that data. It doesn't work. Uh, principles of data science, one of the basic principles is decentralize the data in context of definable process. When you're a car manufacturing plant, there's one process. In healthcare, we have hundreds or thousands of processes. So it's really important to understand the context. The way we would measure value for a hernia care process is very different than for a breast cancer process or a trauma process. So, you know, that's the starting point. Each contextual application is going to have different starting points and different end ending points dependent on the, the context of that process. When you started the company 10 years ago, as you sit here today, what did you absolutely not foresee that would be the headwinds at this point in time? Good question. I mean, I think it took longer to build out the infrastructure needed for all this data collection, right? Because we started out in the OR with digital surgery things because you didn't have the infrastructure to capture some of the data, right? So I think the process of getting all the pipes to get to all the kind of data flows took more time than you would think. Um, and then, of course, the process of adoption, right? Because, you know, we've had a bit of this conversation before this. How do you sort of you know, show the vision for a turnkey solution that could improve in the context of a procedure, in, in context of management of an entire disease, how can you 
show the journey to improving the overall outcome by having bits and pieces and developing over time, but yet getting into the actual side of care to, to continue making progress. You know, you know, those incentives, the credibility you need to have with surgeons, with administrators, with business people, that takes time. You can't shortcut that. And I think those two things I would argue were the, the biggest surprises coming from out of health, outside healthcare before this. With Care Syntex being around for a decade, and when I chat with people, and we've done work with you uh, right. for, the, for the organization, brought in some great people into the team. There are some people out there that still don't understand what Care Syntex does, like succinctly in a nice little box for me. I want to get each of your perspectives on it, and has that changed in the last couple of years with the new world we're living in and the new data we have with where centers of care are changing to. So you want to open up on that one? Yeah, and I've been working with Care Syntax for over a year and a half now, and, and what attracted me to, to the company was, uh, number one, the vision. The vision is really about transforming healthcare to a sustainable model based on value, and, and that's locked in. Now, how you get there, um, I've also seen Care Syntax is willing to adapt and, and, and learn from the application in the real world. They have systems decentralized in each local environment. They can aggregate the data across the whole patient cycle of care. And that's where what I've learned and what my company has learned to do is taking that data with the frontline clinical team and doing good analytics and visualization with it to gain insights. And it's that kind of symbiosis that I think, um, you know, I've seen Care Syntax uh, understand that vision, that the value of the, that data for the frontline clinical team. And I think a lot of other companies just want to sell technology into the system and not really do the work that's required with the frontline clinical team. Hmm. So, Dennis, you're, you're, this is your baby. Wow. How do you how do you how do you describe for somebody in like one minute exactly what Care Syntax does and exactly who the customer is? Yeah. It's, it's an ongoing challenge to simplify, right? But I think the way we think of our company is an end-to-end -end solution to identify problems you have that could be improved or excellence that you want to scale, diagnose the root causes of that, and then use automation, use people, use data science to fix it, improve it, or bring it to other service lines, and then sustain it. So we have the skip process. It's called, you know, essentially identify, diagnose, and act, and assure. And that process is basically what we do. And we do this with as much tech enablement as we can, using data and software, but also people, right? So we like to think of ourselves as a service enablement, service enabled tech company for improving surgical outcomes. And you can't do this unless you get the data science piece right to understand your cohorts where you have great things or not so great things happening, understand why it's happening with another layer of analytics, and then somehow act and then somehow sustain what you have achieved, right? And I think most solutions on the market, they do a part of that for different use cases, and very few companies uh, have been able to aggregate this, right, into uh, both a technology operating system and also, I guess, data science and services ecosystem around it. So it's a turnkey proposition where we do not sell software. We sell programs and solutions that include software, data science, and people. Right, and I think that's the biggest differentiator we have with a lot of the names you may know in the space. Well, you integrate more into the Care Syntax portfolio than some of the others that just specialize specifically in video or specialize in uh, data aggregation up to the cloud. Um, and how complex is that? And who is the buyer and who pays for the Care Syntax platform? Because you're almost like a utility. When I, when I think about you, you're a utility, you overlay all of the different manufacturers, all of the boxes in the OR, the outcomes, aggregate that data, and then increase efficiencies, if, if I want to really simplify. Aggregation, yeah. Yeah. So, so who ends up paying for this? How do I work this out into a procedure? Where is there a reimbursement on this? Uh, who, who benefits from this and then who pays for it, right? Because yeah. rewards drive behavior. Yeah, no, I think that kind of goes back to the initial conversation of how far before and after you need to track data and right, you know, the outcome and the episode itself, where does it begin and end and what's the total cost of it? And organization that understand the total cost of managing the disease 
are best positioned to understand the value of it. And that could be a provider organization if it has that view, if it has its own health plan, if it understands uh, you know, the longitudinal view of cost for its patients. It could be a payer that's working with a provider organization. It could be a physician-owned uh, independent provider group that's wanting to contract with different parties. So I think it depends on the situation, but I think the common ground here is the need to understand you know, both the system that is needed to be maintained and built to create the clinical outcome and also understand the cost implications, right? And that varies. I would say our users are universally on the provider side, right? Because surgery is done in ORs, whether they're ambulatory or in acute uh, inpatient setting. So our users and people who administer and create the outcome are on the hospital provider side. And so for that reason alone, they're crucial because without them, there is no outcome. There is no disease treatment, right? Everybody else um, around it, whether it's part of their own org or it's a separate party, they are there to bridge the incentive gap, uh, share risk of something that is still uncertain because of the complexity of the overall system that a surgical episode is, right? It's a very complex system that has many variables, and so it's only natural that this uncertainty is risky to most. So care syntax data aggregation, simply put, right? And then gives you, gives you outcomes and then potential advisement. So how do, you, how do you manage that kind of data when it's coming from so many different suppliers potentially? And do all suppliers want their data to be revealed? Because sometimes- <laughs> Or providers. You, right, or <laughs> providers. So, so how, how, how do you work through that? So it's a process, right? This is, this is really a disruption of the current status quo. Um, most uh, companies are selling into the, the current state in healthcare, the fragmentation, right? Electronic medical record companies sell into the hospital, to the clinic, and all these fragments are, are not working together. And this is what we can do with the aggregation around the most important process in all of healthcare, which is the patient process. Uh, how we simplify that and do the data appropriately is to work, again, decentralized with a frontline clinical team and identify what really matters to this patient process in this local environment to you and your patients. And that'll be different for different local environments. This is what Netflix does for uh, sending different sets of movies and shows to different what they call taste clusters. And they use local environmental variables and cultural variables and they stack algorithms. And we need to do the same thing in healthcare so we can match the optimal value treatment with each patient subpopulation. And when we do that, we can have a sustainable healthcare system. Mm. And you're able to flex that in these changing centers of care, procedures, you know, not every procedure, even though it's the same surgical procedure, has all kinds of variables in right. it. Surgeons do things all different ways. Right. So I was always curious about that is, how do we take styles, techniques, and then assign a value to them and a score to them, mm -hmm. right? And, and really simple, optimal, less than optimal. Or me so, so that's what the science is all about, measurement and improvement. And if you can measure something, you can improve it if you use the tools appropriately. But it's not just measuring um, value-based outcomes, it's how to measure different uh, factors within that process. So like you said, how do we measure the different variations in technique? How do we assess the value of those different variations in technique for different patient subpopulations. That's, that's part of the fun of the science, is working together to improve measurements. I'll give you one example. We uh, measured uh, outcomes. I did a lot of abdominal wall reconstruction, big surgeries, lots of wound complications. And we were measuring wound infection the way everybody does, the CDC definition, superficial deep organ space. But then we asked patients who had wound infections, what do you think of that measurement? And they were like, that doesn't make any sense. And we said, well, how should we measure wound infection? I said, well, how invasive is the treatment that was required to heal our wound and how long did it take to heal our wound. And we found that measurement was a much better reflection of value than the CDC measurement. So it's all about continuous improvement of what we measure, how we measure, and how we um, look at our outcomes in terms of value. Because once you can measure it, you can improve it. And then finally, Dennis and, and Bruce, thanks. That's a, that, that was a crystallizing conversation for me on this. So now what you have to do is you have to have the challenge of going after current definitions of, 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 of outcomes, right? Because that is sort of a blunt force trauma that maybe the CDC put forth as, as your example. Right. Now you're toying with the idea of changing workflow and changing process, which is what all clinicians don't want done mm -hmm. 
which pushes away adoption and utilization sometimes, is this is the way I've done it 15 years. Mm -hmm. You can measure all you want. And you can tell me that sh something should be changed, but now I have to change my procedure, my work team has to change. What kind of inertial forces does that have facing you? Yeah, anything that tr is transformational to care is, is not a one day over the other um, project. So I think the, the helpful part is that, as you saw in that hallway there, there are dozens and dozens of surgeons that understand this and champion this and want this to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think there isn't resistance that is intellectual, there isn't any resistance of the passion people have. I think the resistance is only, you know, practical and unfortunate uh, part of having a very difficult uh, work-life balance over the last few years. And I think having organizations where it's, it's very hard to get things done in the context of how work has been shaping up over the last 24 months. So that's a good thing, right? We don't have fundamental opposition from surgeons who quarterback these episodes in terms of needing the data, needing to be able to understand why things are happening and then acting on it with support of technology. Non-existent problem. Everything else is basically, uh, you know, factors of making an organization and a, and, and a business in healthcare, which is matters of legal protection, matters of security on data, matters of governance together with physicians and administrators in terms of making it objective, making it non-punitive or right. you know, making it neutral. So I think it's probably an impossibility to think about health tech as tech without some sort of governance means experts in the loop, right? So coaches and 360 degree workflow observers of some sort in a scalable way is a necessity. And so for us, we solve for these issues by communicating with these people, right? You have to be able to do it upfront. As you go in an organization, it simply becomes a way of doing things. Like I was talking to our long-term client in the US, University of Iowa, and I said, well, how are you doing? It's like, well, it's just the Iowa way now, right? People are saying, like, of course, I'm going to grab this piece of data and I'm going to use it. You guys don't have that, right? So, you know, these things are, fortunately, they accumulate into, you know, an embedded process and that investment that we have to make in terms of people, et cetera, incentive management, it is not a recurring investment. Well, gentlemen, thanks so much. I really appreciate the time. Uh, I know you've been traveling like a uh, madman as usual. And Bruce, I always appreciate the data scientists and the intelligence side of things. So thanks very Thank much. Thank you, Joe. Thank Pleasure. you very much. I'm Joe Mullings from Sages, SDTS, the next big thing. Be well.